so much at the camera. Yeah. But you know, if you want to look at the camera too, that's fine too. But that's the kind of yeah. technical telecom way of doing things. Yeah. Okay, we're rolling. We're ready. All right. My name is David Ulbrick, and this is September sixth, two thousand seven. What is your full name, sir? George Franklin Messick. And when and where were you born? Coolamy, North Carolina. And which squadron of the 376 were you in? 512th. Um, before you uh, joined the military, can you, re can you tell me a little bit of what life would have been like during the Great Depression or after the war started? Well, not much after, until after the war started. Uh, I was working in a, a textile plant at that time. And I left there and went to an aircraft factory in Akron, Ohio. And did you and uh, did you volunteer or were you drafted? I was drafted. Yeah. And uh, when you uh, when you uh, were drafted and when you went through the process, how did you end up in the U.S. Army Air Force? They gave us well. I went to Fort Jackson, South Carolina, and they gave us an aptitude test, and I scored high on the mechanical. They sent it from there then to Keesler Field, Mississippi. Had my basic training there, then went through aircraft mechanic school. And uh, uh, in terms of being an aircraft mechanic, uh, was that, uh, how did you uh, go from there uh, to being uh, a flight engineer, or could you have been a grounds crew mechanic, or how did they make that decision? Well, at that time they were short on gunners. And everybody that was qualified for the gunners, the question was asked, you want to volunteer for it to let nature take its course? And I said, let's see what nature does. Uh. So when the rest of them shipped up to gunnery school, I went to gunnery school with them at Laredo, Texas. And uh, what was the training like in gunnery school? Uh, can you give me a, 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 a typical lesson or the types of things they taught you? Well, they, they just taught us uh, about... Uh, Leading your targets, the projector, and what the mount velocity will do to your to your ammunition, and so forth, like that. And we left from uh, well, when we first had our training, we used shotguns on clay pigeons. Then we left there and went to uh, Eagle Pass, Texas, and had our air-to-air -air firing. And uh, what does it mean to lead the target? Can you describe what that means for me, please? That was. The distance you had to have before the target to make sure that you that uh, your target and your your projectile come together at the same time. Yeah. Were you an officer or an enlisted man? I was an enlisted man. Yeah. Um, when did you learn, and how did you learn uh, about uh, flying? Uh, you, when and how did you learn you would be flying in the B twenty four? and in the uh, 376 bomb group. How did that come about? Well, when I completed gunnery school, I went to Salt Lake City and they assigned us to uh, a crew. Then uh, we went from there to the B-24 training in Bigsville, El Paso, Texas. So you just crisscrossed the nation, didn't you? That's right. <laughs> As a, before you joined, had you done that much traveling? No. So you were definitely seeing the United States of America. When I left my, my home in North Carolina, uh, that was the second time I was out of the state. And, you know, these various uh, 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 periods of training, were they, you know, four, six, eight weeks, or was there a different time frame? About they, how long they, were they? They were, they were different time frames. The mechanic school was the longest. I don't remember exactly how long it was. And the gunner school was, was rather short. We had about two weeks of ground and about a, uh, uh, one week of air-to-air uh, -air firing. Yeah. And uh, uh, moving back just a little bit, when were you drafted, roughly? In March 1943. And then when did you finally ship overseas uh, to, I guess, southern Italy by that time? In May of 1944. So you went through, what, 14 months of training? Off and on, I guess March to May, fifteen months, thirteen months. About th about thirteen months, because I had a I had a leave in the, in the meantime too. Yeah. Very good. So, um, 
How did you um, how did you get from the United States to Southern Italy? Were you flown or were you on a ship? We uh, we went to uh, Topeka, Kansas, and picked up a new aircraft to ferry across. And did you fly south through South America across, or did you go South north? America? South South America over to Africa and that that way. Did you uh, so what? Did you recall what that what that flight was with all that fuel flying over two three thousand miles of the Atlantic Ocean? Do you reflect any memories about that, or did you just? No, the only, only thing I can remember too much about it, we were flying at around nine thousand feet all the time. Uh, they said we had to do submarine patrol down through there too. Ah, uh, look out yeah. for subs. Well, I think yeah. it's a good idea. Certainly, certainly. Did you see any subs? No, sir. So um, moving on to something, um, you know, moving on to the actual combat experience. Uh, uh, what was the easiest milk run you had, or was there was there a milk run? Well, I guess the one of the easiest ones I was ever on was was uh, over Yugoslavia. I think it was Zagreba, Yugoslavia. And what was that target that you were trying uh, to hit? I can't. I, I don't know. All right. I don't remember right now. But. Uh, then uh, what were what were two or three of the toughest targets? Well, some of the toughest targets was around Vienna and uh, Ploesti oil fields. Oh yes, Ploesti. That's that's the infamous yeah. one. Um, what was what was tough about those? Did you have to worry so much about fighters, or were you more worried about flak? We're more worried about flak because we saw very few fighters. As I understand it, the uh, fighters by then had been pulled back to Berlin, had been pulled back to Germany, and unless you were, you know. Well, I, on the first mission, I, I saw fighters that uh, over in Munich. Munich. Well, that's 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 southern Germany, if my memory yeah. serves me correctly. Um. <clears throat> What was your closest call to being shot down that you can remember? What was the... Well, we didn't have any really close calls of being shot down. We did our mechanical failure and had to bail out over enemy territory. Wow, can you tell me what, what happened with, with that episode? Well, we landed... Well, first, our airplane, the thir number three engine, caught fire. Well, we got it out, and then uh, we lost all the oil pressure on number two, and we were trying to make it up to the Hungarian Yugoslav border so we'd get rid of our bombs. We weren't permitted to drop them in Yugoslavia except a brief target. So we, we, as we crossed over the river there at Budapest. We got rid of our, our bombs and started back. Then the cylinder head temperature on the number one cylinder started climbing. And so the time we got back down to near Sarajevo, the, uh, the pilot gave the order to, to bail out. So you're essentially down to one engine by that time. One good one. one we good still one. had two running, but we were losing power on one. Yeah. Wow, well, I guess yeah. that is time to bail out then. Yeah. Certainly you can't make al keep altitude or anything. We had, a, we had a, uh, about a 12,000 foot mountain to go over at that time. Yeah. Wow. So you bailed out and... Uh, Tell me what that was like. Tell me what happened once you hit the ground. Well, I hit the ground. Uh, I was on the ground by myself for approximately seven hours. During that time, all I heard was one woman hollering and dogs barking, and I tried to run the opposite direction from where the noise was coming from. And then uh, later on, then I was following a path up on the side of the mountain. And as I went by on that path, somebody hollered, Stow. And I looked down, there was a man on the road down below, and uh, he had a rifle to his shoulder. He motioned me to come down, and I didn't go right down. Then I saw the Patrick Carroll, who was our navigator, there, and I happened to look back at him, and there was a uh, a Serbian dressed in a full German uniform with a submachine gun. So I got back up behind the tree and, and I hollered down to him. I said, is it okay, Pat? He said, yeah, come on down, it's okay. 
So I got with the Chetniks, the underground at that time, and stayed with them until we were, until we were flown back to Italy. And uh, these were fighting, that these were underground, these were partisans fighting the Germans? These were the Chetniks. The Chetniks. The partisans uh, were fighting the Chetniks and the Germans. And the Chetniks were fighting the Germans also? And yes. the partisans. Everyone was yeah. fighting everybody. That's right. In there. They right. called it the four-sided war. <laughs> and uh, how, long did you, how long did you remain with the Chetniks? Forty days. And what was... What was that like? Did you did you were you able to get good night's sleep or hot food or were you living out on tents? Well, the the food was a big thing. They didn't have anything. They gave us the best they had. Some nights we slept out in the open. Sometimes we slept in barns, and sometimes we slept in people's home. And uh, I know the first night I slept there uh, on July the second. It was real cold up in those mountains at that was time. That, that would have been 1944, July 19, the 2nd? 1944. July the 2nd. Yeah, July the 2nd. 1944. Yeah. So you're there for 40 days. Were you ever, did you ever feel like you were in danger of being captured by the Germans or by the, the, the uh, Yugoslav, the Yugoslavs? Yeah. Uh, no, I was never afraid of the Germans because we could sit on the side of the mountains and watch the Germans go by. Below, they didn't leave the main roads. But there was only one instance that we had that we, I think was, was in for some trouble with some uh, the uh, Chetniks. And so we, we had a fellow with us that uh, could speak seven different languages, and he, but no English. <laughs> we, we did have our bombardier had, had joined us at that time, and also our ball gunner. And he could speak some French, and so we made it out then. And they, and uh, we decided that we didn't want to spend the night in that town. So uh, we bribed the guard to take us to the next town, and he did. Yeah. And so you made your way back eventually to uh, American forces. Just well, we actually made our way up to uh, about ninety miles south of Belgrade in Yugoslavia. And they uh, cleared the top of a mountain. And they had to, what came in to pick us up, they called a halyard mission. mission and uh, they landed uh, three airplanes on August the 9th. They, they sent nine over, and only three landed. And they picked the, the most seriously wounded up and uh, flew them back that night. And the next night, or the next morning, rather, they, they landed, and I got the last airplane out of there. Wow. Yeah, they cleared the top of the mountains, and they'd go off the side of that mountain and disappear. And you see them coming up of them. Oh, all right. So, all right. so they, they didn't have quite enough speed, so they're dropping, picking up airspeed, and then regaining yeah, altitude. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it worked out real good, though. That must have been quite an odd thing just to, to watch that happen and say, yeah. oh, my gosh, I'm going to be on that next one, crossing my fingers. Well, I got the last one, though. <laughs> um. Want to uh, turn to a, a you know a, a slightly different topic here, and uh, I want you to understand that if you're you know you don't need to answer every question yeah. if you if you're not comfortable with it. But um, it's it's often said that there's no atheist in foxholes, and um, you know uh, to what degree, if at all, if if it happened at all, to what degree did your experience in combat affect? Uh, your religious faith or your notion of God or anything of that nature? It, it never affected because I was always a believer. Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, so when you took the airplane off the top of the mountain, you, uh, you made your way back to uh, American forces. Yes. And uh, did, they, did they give you any... Uh, uh, leave at that time, or do they cycle you directly back in? What what happened after that? What was the process of getting sort of recycled? Well, uh, actually, since they picked up about 275 of us at that time, they put a time limit on the time that you were in there. It had to be 42 days, and I came up two days short of coming back home. So uh, our commanding officer called me in. He talked to me. 
He said, I think you deserve to go home, so I'm going to give you these privileges. You can fly with who you want to, when you want to, and where you want to. So then I did have a, uh, a week of rest and relaxation down in southern Italy. Then I went back and I was assigned to a combat crew again. So did you fly with that same combat crew the whole time, or did you take advantage of your, of your privilege and fly when you wanted and how you wanted? Well, I didn't fly in it for quite a while. And uh, I went up and saw the CEO one night, told him, I said, I'd like to go on the, on the, the mission tomorrow. I said, I want to get him in so I can go home. And he said, it's going to be a rough one. So let me pick one for you. I said, okay. So he did. He picked one up in northern Italy, Vizio Vidoc. And we went back home that day with more holes in the ship than we got in all the other missions I'd flown. Awesome. Then I flew either two or three missions with that crew. Then I asked to be relieved of it. Then I was assigned to Captain Robert Miller's crew, yeah. which I know that's familiar to you. Yes, sir. The um, in, in terms of getting to know the guys and the crews and all that, uh, did were they accepting of you immediately, or was there kind of a was there was there any caution? Or I mean, you were all you were all flyers, so you know you were all flew. Well, together. I had flown with the crew before as a replacement, and the engineer that I replaced on there, uh, we were in a hospital in bed side by side with the same surgery before we went overseas. So I knew him, and so I got to know some of the other, you know, the crew then. Then when you're, when you're flying these, these later missions after your, you know, your experience on the ground, after having bailed out, were you, flying, uh, were you flying as a flight engineer or as a gunner? Or uh, Well, or I this? actually, I went on as flight engineer, but the uh, second engineer, he wanted to strike, so I said, give it to him. So they gave me the top torch to fly. And tell me a little bit about uh, the the top turret. Were you in? Uh, um, did you have occasion to ever, you know, uh, shoot at enemy fighters? Not from the top guns, no. Then, uh, in terms of, uh, did in any of your missions, did you did you serve as a flight engineer? No, never did. When you were. Uh, when you were um, um, grounded for weather or in between missions or something along those lines, what did you do for, for recreation? Well, a lot of times we would go into Lecce and, you know, and just go around, maybe find some place you get some, some good food or something like that, something a little different. No. And that was about it over there. Yeah. So uh, what was the actual physical base like where you were based in terms of what was your sleeping arrangement? Were you sleeping in a, some sort of Quonset hut or in a tent or in, in a house? Well, we were in a tent. Well, we, um, we hired an Italian to come in. After I came back from Yugoslavia, uh, we had the Italian come in and lay a block for us. And there was only four of us in the tent. And we built a stove and it was rather comfortable then. Can you uh, 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 can you tell me some some stories about some of uh, your friends or buddies? Uh, what's the funniest story that you can recall about your about the other guys in one of your crews? Not, I don't have any right off the top of my head. Oh, I'll tell you. No, I, that's fine. Well, maybe we'll maybe I'll ask you again in a, in a few minutes here. Um, in terms of being on base in southern Italy, where uh, where were regulations and discipline very, very uh, tight there? Or, well, you know, did you have to have your uniform and regulation? Did you have to salute everybody that you walked past? Or was it more laid back? It's, it was more laid back because we could pretty well, well dress. Because you may go out for digs one day and your flight suit the next day or something like that. So you never knew. Um, in terms of uh, uh, flying these bombing missions, and this is a you know a little bit of a tougher question, do you feel um, any remorse or guilt about 
obviously we're bombing a military target. There's, you know, there's no, no, that's one thing. But you know, maybe, uh, you know, uh, maybe accidentally killing some civilians or someone, someone along those lines. Do you feel any remorse or guilt about that? Not really. No, we, we were briefed to bomb the bomb the heart of Vienna at one time, but they canceled that mission. Yeah, you know, the Americans typically did not engage in that kind of bombing. The uh, the British would would do more. The Royal Air Force would do more area bombing and yes. and, mm -hmm. and bomb more more uh, larger areas. Did you re uh, Did you receive any uh, any medals or citations? I received six medals. Ah, for uh, can you remember any of the particulars for well, those? Purple Heart, Air Medal with two clusters, Good Conduct, European Theater, in Middle East, uh, Victory Medal, Vi American Campaign, Victory in Europe Medal. That's right. For the Purple Heart, what was what did uh, what did you receive that for? I was injured in the parachute jump. I don't know whether I hit the plane. Or a strap when we walk. We were under enemy fire when we were jumping, and uh, I got a cut over the left eye. Yeah. So, um, uh, was that probably the the moment when you were uh, sort of most fearful for your life, or was there other were there other moments? Well, you know, I, I don't uh, feel any time that I was real fe fearful for it. Really, the the Closest I actually remember coming of being hit or anything in in flight was when uh, a tail gunner in a plane flying ahead of us test fired his gun and I got a spent case so it brushed to cut my collar on my jacket. Did uh, did any of the German flak ever hit the aircraft near where you were? Yes, several, a lot of times. I flew a nose gun one one flight. And all out in front of it was black with anti-aircraft fire. And you're just flying right through it, basically. You had no choice. Yeah. So uh, uh, yeah. was there, you know, I guess the, the shrapnel must have been peppering the, 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 the glass? Yes. Well, like I said about the, the Iviso Vidoc, we got a lot of holes in the ship that day. Yeah. And that was supposed to be an easy milk run, right? That's right. Yeah. yeah that's a... Maybe you shouldn't listen to someone when they say it's the easy milkron, right? More often than not, and it isn't. Anytime we went to Northern Italy to the, in those mountains, it wasn't easy. Yeah. The um, in terms of the uh, uh, the you said you had done the uh, the top turret and the nose turret. Uh, <laughs> can you uh, tell me what you uh, uh, what you thought about the Browning 50 caliber machine gun? Can you describe the equipment? Or you know whether it worked well or not. The, the only problem I ever had with a brownie was on my my first mission, and I was using hydraulic gun chargers on the tail guns, and uh, it jammed in third position on me, and I turned the the uh, gun he, the heaters on, and it released in. Yeah, it's the only problem I ever had with one of those guns. Yeah. So you were saying uh, the uh, the charger. That's when you uh, basically put a bullet in the uh, put a, put a round in the chamber. Is well, that we right? were we were taught in gunnery school to clear your guns going to altitude by charging them, which uh, we learned in a hurry in combat. You didn't do that because a lot of times there'd be a lot of oil and all on them, and they would freeze on you. So what you do, you you shot you fire a short burst. And the heat from the guns will, will break it all loose. And, yeah. um, what was the uh, well, uh, what was the um, flight suit like? What was uh, what was it like to wear a flight suit that was really thick and the uh, whole uh, uh, the electric heaters and that sort of thing? Can you tell me a little bit about that, please? Well, I didn't in in combat. I never wore one of the real heavy flight suits. I had electrically heated suit did it that I used most of the time. And they, they were more uh, comfortable than the, the, the heavy equipment. The heavy equipment, you couldn't hardly move around in the aircraft with it. Yeah. 
So um, when did you finish up your, what would have been your 35th mission? When, when, when did you finish your, your, your tour? Well, uh, Roughly. It had been my 38th mission on December the 6th, 1944. December the 6th. I didn't fly a food tour. I was grounded. Yeah. And then uh, uh, how long did it take for you to uh, cycle through and get uh, transported back to the United States? Well, we left the squadron in, uh, on January the 2nd, on the 6th of December to January the 2nd. Did you fly home or did you take a boat? Came back by boat, yeah. And then... Uh, what happened after that? Did you remain in the Air Force, or did you get out and, and go I, back to civilian life? I got out in uh, September of 45. Following that, you know, the, those years, did you, uh, this is kind of post-war stuff, but did you, uh, you know, take advantage of any of the GI Bill opportunities, the, uh, uh, the college education and that sort of thing? No, I didn't, no. Were you... Did many of the people know that you knew do that, or? Yeah, quite a few did, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Another question here. Um, when you were stationed overseas, uh, uh, did you write many letters home, or did you receive many letters from home? Uh, well, not too many, because I'm not much of a writer, and uh, I'd write my mother uh, a letter every now and then, let her know I was getting along okay. Because I know for some, for some, it's uh, getting that mail call. Did, did did you get mail regularly, or, or was mail delivered regular regularly? It, it's best I can remember. It was fairly regular. I know she sent me a package with a, little, a lot of cookies and all in it one time, and they were all crumbs when I got them. Sure. About how long would it take for a letter to leave states and? get to where you were. Do you have any idea, any notion? Well, I'll probably take about a month or so. Yeah. Where were you when, uh, or do you recall where you were, what you were doing when you heard about maybe the uh, uh, defeat of, of Germany in May 1945 or later on when the war was over? And I was pulling night CQ at uh, Chinook Field down to Illinois. So you were working at night and you got the news? and Working um, at night. <laughs> what about uh, later on in August when the whole war was over? I was still there. Still, still there. Still doing the same thing. Was it at night? Or do you, I guess you would probably know. Well, uh, uh, I was a night uh, CQ three nights a week. That was the job that I had there at that time. What does yeah. CQ stand Charger for? Charger Quarters. Charger Quarters. Yeah. So was that, um, and, and uh, were those... Quarters were those barracks for people, or well, yeah, the uh, the squadron you were in at that time. When the the, the first sergeant told me this way, he says, "I run the place by, by day, and you run it by night." Yeah. So I had three days on, and four days off. Yeah. Uh, just a, a couple of more questions for you. Um, this is a question I ask uh, all the veterans whether they're airmen or Marines or soldiers or sailors of World War II. Uh, you know, you've often been nicknamed the greatest generation. And my question is this. Um, do you consider yourself to be, quote, unquote, a hero? No. Why or why not? I think the true hero has been come home. That's an answer that a lot of your, a lot of your fellow veterans give, mm -hmm. definitely. And um, for, you know, the, the coming generations, um, is there anything you would like them to know just in general about your service or your views of World War II or, or anything else? This is kind of your, uh, your open, open-ended platform. Well, I understand that they're not teaching a lot of it in the, in the high schools and all anymore. And I think that they, they should uh, teach more of the history of it and all, you know, in there. Well, you're... I, I think you're right. There's less emphasis on that on, yeah. on World War II, and of course the uh, uh, the human interest stories, the human condition, and the fact that you had a generation of Americans who had, you know, been through the Great Depression and then were called upon. You know, many of you were sort of ordinary men called upon to deal with extraordinary circumstances. Right. Mm -hmm. 
and I think that's that's certainly in inspiring. So, is there anything else you'd like to to say? No, I don't. Not really. I can't think of anything right off the hand anyway. Yeah. Did you did you uh, did you think about a funny story? Did you happen to did a no? I didn't think about a funny story. No. Well, <laughs> oh, only, only one. All right, please. One guy wanted to uh, uh, get out of flying combat, and he shot the end of his finger off. And he come up through there. He said, "Look what happened to me!" Held his hand up, and the end of his finger was missing, and blood squirting out of it. No. <laughs> So did he? Did they? Did they send him off to hospitals or send him back to fly anyway? I, I imagine did. I don't know. I don't know what score what the ending of that was. I call that the million dollar wound in other <laughs> wars, but shooting off the end of your finger—that's not very convincing. You got to get something a little more yeah. important than the end yeah. of your finger. Yeah. I did have one one guy that to room with me. He'd been over there about three years, and he decided he wanted to come home, so he. Uh, he volunteered to be, to become a narrow photographer, and he. I'd get up in the mornings usually before he did, and I'd go outside and I'd come back in. He said, "Do I have to go get shot at today?" And I said, "No, it's cloudy out. You never get off the ground." So he'd get up and he'd look out and he'd come back and he'd start swearing at me. He says, "I'm never going to believe you again." Yeah. yeah. Um. Something just jumped in my mind. Uh, what was the chow like? What did you have for for chow? And uh, did you get anything when you went into town? Did you were able to get better chow? Well, no. We we usually could get some good spaghetti, and some of their red wine, which was usually very good. Well, wasn't but uh, on the base, there, our food wasn't too bad at all. For breakfast, they would be some Italian there selling eggs. Two for thirty-five cents, and the, the cooks would cook them for you and all. So uh, we did that, and we, of course, we had sea rations every meal, if you wanted them. But a lot of us, you know, passed them up. And, you know. <laughs> I can, can only imagine. Do you have, do you have any uh, doubts or regrets about going the Air Force? Would you, would you, would you have rather have been, you know, in the uh, in the infantry or a sailor? Or, you, were you that, glad that you went the way you did? I'm glad I went the way I did, yeah. What's, yeah. what's very interesting to me is I've, I've interviewed some soldiers and, you know, I uh, tell them about my father's experiences yeah. and I do that to kind of, you know, build some trust yeah. and some, you know, common ground with them. And, and you should see the soldiers, you know, these are soldiers from the 1st Infantry division or whatever, and their eyes get really big, and they said, "Well, I was glad I was in a foxhole and not flying over there." And I've talked with sailors, and they're like, yeah. "I'm glad I was on a ship and not flying over there." So it seems like people are kind of glad they yeah. they didn't want to be there, yeah, but they were glad they were where they were as opposed to yeah. another, you know, an, another service. Yeah. Well, that sleeping in the foxhole didn't appeal to me at all. No, 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 no. I mean, no, not at all, not at all. Well, that's about all that I've got. So, okay. are you? I hope I answered everything okay for you. Yeah. You did a great job, George. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, David. Yeah. All right.